To know how many calories we should eat, we first need to work out our total daily energy expenditure. There are three primary components which contribute to energy expenditure. First is basal metabolic rate, which is usually the largest contributor. It is thought to contribute around 60 to 70% of total energy expenditure in most cases. Second is the thermic effect of food. This is the smallest component, estimated to be around 10% of total daily energy expenditure in most cases. And third is movement, which can further be subcategorized into non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT for short, and physical activity. This is the most variable component, but in most cases it is thought to contribute around 20-30% to of total energy expenditure. Let's now discuss each component in a little more detail. First, let's discuss basal metabolic rate. This is the energy required for essential human functions such as breathing, blood circulation, cell production, and so on. We can essentially think of basal metabolic rate as the energy we would expend if we were laying down in bed without moving. Basal metabolic rate is mostly a product of how much total lean mass we currently have. Those with more lean mass typically have a higher basal metabolic rate, while those with less lean mass typically have a lower basal metabolic rate. This study measured body composition and basal metabolic rate of 81 elite Japanese male athletes from different sport categories. It was found that basal metabolic rate was fairly strongly associated with lean body mass for all athletes in different sport categories. Our basal metabolic rate also changes with changes in body weight. Gaining weight typically increases our basal metabolic rate, while weight loss typically reduces it. This is likely mostly due to changes in lean mass, but also possibly due to changes in fat mass too. For example, this study assessed energy expenditure in obese subjects who had lost significant body weight. It was found that after losing 10% of their initial weight, resting energy expenditure decreased by around 270 calories per day. And after losing 20% of their initial body weight, resting energy expenditure decreased by a further 100 calories or so. While these changes are mostly due to lean mass changes, body fat also seems to be somewhat metabolically active too, although not to the same magnitude as lean mass. In other words, having more body fat means that your basal energy expenditure will be a little higher, even if lean mass is the same. This was seen in this study, which aimed to quantify what tissues contribute to our resting energy expenditure. This graph shows the amount of calories expended by each tissue at rest in subjects of different body weights. As mentioned, lean tissues like skeletal muscle mass, the liver, and the brain contribute the largest amount to resting energy expenditure in both males and females. Although adipose tissue also contributes a small amount too. Depending on body fat levels, adipose tissue seems to contribute somewhere around 60 to 200 calories per day. Next, we have the thermic effect of food. This is the temporary increase in our metabolic rate used to intake, digest, absorb, and metabolize the food we eat. This is generally thought to contribute around 10% of total daily energy expenditure, but the exact value will differ based on how much we eat and what macronutrients are consumed. According to Examine, protein increases the thermic effect of food the most, while fat has the smallest increase. So a high-protein, low-fat diet might expend a little more energy per day compared with a low-protein, high-fat diet. Although these differences are not all that meaningful in practice. This review article reviewed the effects of high-protein diets on various different outcomes. Based on the available data, they hypothesized that doubling protein intake during a 2,000-calorie diet would increase daily energy expenditure via the thermic effect of food by around 23 calories per day. And the third component of energy expenditure is movement. This refers to any movement of the body which requires energy to perform. As mentioned, this can be subcategorized into NEAT and physical activity. NEAT refers to subconscious movements like fidgeting, as well as movements required for daily tasks, like cleaning the house or walking around the grocery store to buy food. Whereas physical activity refers to intentional movement, such as playing sport, lifting in the gym, performing cardio, and so on. Although whether movement is classified as NEAT or physical activity isn't really important as it relates to energy expenditure. 
The simplest and most practical way to quantify total activity levels is to use step counts. While it isn't perfect, it will provide an overall decent indicator of your activity levels, including both neat and intentional exercise. The energy we expend via movement can be highly variable depending on how active we are. Someone who is more active will expend more energy via movement, whereas less active individuals might expend very little energy via movement. Although we should note that more movement doesn't have a linear additive effect on total daily energy expenditure. This study has termed this phenomenon the constrained model of energy expenditure. What this means is that as more exercise is performed, other components of energy expenditure are down-regulated. So while doing more exercise does burn more calories, it might not have as much of an impact on total daily energy expenditure as we might predict. For example, this study compared the effects of different physical activity levels on energy expenditure. 11 adult men underwent three different exercise routines on different days, shown in this table. Each protocol resulted in a total daily step count of 9,000, 30,000 and 24,000 in each group respectively. Although energy expenditure wasn't increased in proportion with activity levels. On the lowest activity day, total energy expenditure was around 2,200 calories, and on the other higher activity days it was around 2,800 calories. If we add the energy expended from each of these components, we get our total daily energy expenditure number. For most people, we would typically expend somewhere around 2,000 to 3,000 calories per day. Heavier individuals carrying more lean mass who are highly active will typically expend more energy than lighter, leaner, and less active individuals. So your exact energy expenditure per day is very difficult to accurately quantify and your energy expenditure likely changes slightly from day to day. There are calculations you can use to estimate your total daily energy expenditure, which can be useful as a starting point. However, they can often be up to several hundred calories off in some cases, so we need to adjust our targets based on our body weight changes, as we will discuss later in the video. The next factor determining how many calories we should consume is what energy balance state we are aiming for. In other words, are we trying to be in a calorie surplus to gain weight, a deficit to lose weight, or maintenance to maintain body weight? To gain weight over time, we need to eat more calories than we expend. To lose weight over time, we need to eat fewer calories than we expend. And to maintain weight, we should intake the same number of calories to what we expend. But the next question is, if we want to either gain or lose weight, how much of a calorie surplus or deficit should we aim for? First, let's discuss how much of a calorie deficit we should aim for. A larger calorie deficit will result in a faster rate of weight loss, while a smaller deficit will result in slower weight loss. In most cases, a faster rate of weight loss tends to result in slightly greater losses in lean mass as a proportion of total weight loss. So if your goal is to maintain as much lean mass as possible during weight loss, then a slower rate of weight loss is generally advised. For example, this study compared the effects of losing weight at two different rates on body composition changes. 24 elite athletes recruited from the Norwegian Olympic Sports Centre underwent a weight loss phase during their off-season while simultaneously performing resistance training four times per week as well as participating in their regular sport practice. Half the subjects lost 4.2 kilograms in an average of 8.5 weeks, while the other half lost the same body weight in 5.3 weeks. Although total weight loss was the same in both groups, the slow weight loss group saw slight increases in lean mass, while the fast weight loss group lost a little lean mass. This therefore meant that the slow weight loss group also lost more body fat as a proportion of total body weight compared with the fast weight loss group. So how much of a calorie deficit is required to mitigate losses in lean mass during weight loss? This was explored in this meta-regression, which explored the influence of the magnitude of a calorie deficit on changes in lean mass. It was found that larger calorie deficits tend to increase the likelihood of lean mass losses, while smaller calorie deficits may mitigate lean mass losses, and potentially even permit further gains. The approximate point at which lean mass losses tend to be observed is when the calorie deficit is greater than around 500 calories per day. As we have discussed, it is difficult to calculate our precise energy expenditure since it fluctuates over time based on a number of variables. 
This makes it difficult to predict how much weight will be lost over a certain amount of time based on a calorie target. So instead of aiming for a calorie deficit of a particular calorie number, it is more accurate to aim for a desired rate of weight loss. Here are some general recommendations for the rates of weight loss that are appropriate for those at different levels of body fat. Those with a higher body fat don't really need to worry too much about their rate of weight loss. Slightly leaner individuals might want to avoid losing weight at a rate of greater than 1% per week. At relatively healthy levels of body fat, individuals should probably cap their rate of weight loss at around 0.75% of body weight per week. And those who are extremely lean are at a higher risk of muscle loss already, but losing weight at no more than around 0.5% of body weight per week can help to mitigate this. Similar to weight loss, the magnitude of the calorie surplus influences our rate of weight gain. A larger surplus results in faster weight gain, while a smaller surplus results in slower weight gain. The rate at which we intend to gain weight will depend on the purpose of the calorie surplus. But for this video, we will assume that the purpose of weight gain is to enhance our ability to build muscle via resistance training. So, how much of a surplus is recommended to build muscle? Well, novice lifters seem to benefit to a greater extent from a surplus compared with more advanced lifters. This study explored the effects of a large calorie surplus on body composition changes in untrained subjects. 73 untrained males performed a hypertrophy-style resistance training protocol four times per week for eight weeks. One group were assigned to consume their regular diet. The second group were provided with a 2000 calorie supplement consisting of primarily carbohydrates to consume in addition to their regular diet. And the third group were provided with a 2000 calorie supplement too, but this had a higher protein content and less carbohydrates. After eight weeks, the maintenance group approximately maintained body weight, while the two surplus groups gained around three kilograms each. And in all groups, significant gains in fat-free mass were observed although greater gains were experienced in the two surplus groups. The maintenance group lost almost one kilogram of fat mass, while both surplus groups approximately maintained fat mass. However, these same benefits generally aren't observed when more advanced lifters eat in a calorie surplus. For example, this study compared the effects of a smaller versus larger surplus on body composition changes in elite athletes. 39 elite athletes recruited from the Norwegian Olympic Sports Centre performed their regular sports practice plus four resistance training workouts per week. Half the subjects gained 1.2 kilograms in around 10 weeks, while the other half gained 2.7 kilograms over the same time frame. It was found that lean mass increased in both groups, with slightly greater gains seen in the group gaining weight at a faster rate. However, the fast weight gain group also gained significantly more body fat too. So in highly trained athletes, a larger calorie surplus may promote slightly more muscle growth, but it is likely to also increase fat gain disproportionately. If your body fat is already higher than you would like it to be, then a calorie surplus is not recommended. Although if you are already quite lean and want to maximize your rate of muscle growth, here are some general recommendations for rates of weight gain. Novices may benefit from gaining up to 1% of body weight per week in their initial months of lifting. Intermediate lifters should probably aim to gain body weight at no more than around 0.5% of body weight per week. And advanced lifters should aim to gain body weight at no more than around 0.25% of body weight per week. So the number of calories we should consume per day depends primarily on your current energy expenditure and whether you want to gain, lose or maintain body weight. And so you might determine that you need to consume a certain number of calories to meet your calculated targets. While this calculation might be approximately appropriate, it is unlikely to be perfect. And your calorie requirements will also likely need to be adjusted over time based on changes in energy expenditure due to weight gain or weight loss. So to accurately determine calorie requirements for our needs, we need to track our body weight over time and assess the average trend. We can then adjust calorie intake based on what this trend looks like. For example, let's say an individual aimed to consume 2,300 calories with the goal of losing weight at a modest rate. After around six weeks, body weight has been trending downward very slowly, but not as fast as they would have liked. 
So to speed up the rate of weight loss, this individual might decide to reduce calories by 100 to 200 per day to meet their desired rate. In another example, let's say an individual weighed 90 kilograms. They approximated that consuming around 2,800 calories was needed to maintain body weight. Over the next one to two years, they progressively lost 15 kilograms and wanted to maintain this new body weight of 75 kilograms. If physical activity levels are the same, then the calorie intake required to maintain this new lower body weight will likely be a little lower compared to when they weigh 90 kilograms. So instead of maintaining at 2,800 calories, they might need to consume around 2,650 calories or so. And again, this number can be adjusted based on how body weight changes over multiple weeks. To summarize this video, let's establish some practical recommendations. The number of calories you should consume will depend on three primary variables. First is how much energy you expend per day. This is a product of your basal metabolic rate, the thermic effect of food, and how much movement you perform per day. For most people in most cases, this will probably be somewhere around 2 to 3,000 calories per day. Once you have established roughly what your energy expenditure is, the second factor is what energy balance state you want to be in. A calorie deficit is required for weight loss, a surplus for weight gain, or maintenance calories to maintain body weight. And then we need to establish the rate of weight loss or weight gain we want to achieve. A larger calorie deficit or surplus will result in faster weight loss or gain respectively, while a smaller deficit or surplus will result in slower weight loss or gain. And while we can use calculators to establish an approximate calorie target to meet your current goal, your requirements will change over time based on changes in body weight and what energy balance state you want to be in. So we can use our average body weight trends over time to adjust our calorie intake to meet our current goals. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.